Hi, this is Jonathan Gardner covering section 2.5 of Schroeder's An Introduction to Thermal Physics. And in this section, we're going over the ideal gas and calculating the multiplicity of an ideal gas. We're going to rely on quantum mechanics to calculate the multiplicity of the ideal gas. We'll start with one monatomic molecule and then two, and then we'll calculate for n. We'll need to calculate the surface area of a hypersphere in three n dimensions, where n could be anything near Avogadro's numbers, the number of particles in a system. We'll note similarities between this and the Einstein solid we already visited in the last section, or previous sections. And we'll make some observations about what happens when two ideal gases interact through an exchange of energy, volume, and particles. And finally, we'll, I'll wrap up by talking about how unlikely it is to find anything but the most likely cases. The point of this section is to show that any two systems, when brought into thermal contact, will move toward a very definite state with very little distribution from that state, given even a small number of degrees of freedoms and such. This sets us up for a general discussion about this universal observation, which we call entropy in the second law of thermodynamics. In the last video, we talked about how to deal with very big numbers, numbers that are so large that multiplying them by a regular big number has no effect. In the section before that, we learned how to count the states in Einstein solids and paramagnets. So let's start with a monatomic particle. So we have a single particle. It is something like helium, where it doesn't rotate, it doesn't have any vibrational modes. So all of the energy is stored in the kinetic energy. And we stick this into some three-dimensional box of some shape and some size. We will assign a total amount of kinetic energy U, which is the total energy inside the system and we're going to contain this within a box of volume V. We need to know how many possible microstates can exist for the above microstate. So we're going to count omega, and I'm going to call it omega one for the one particle case, and that's going to tell us how many combinations there are that will give us a potential energy, I'm sorry, a kinetic energy of U and inside of the volume V. Our assumptions is that this number should be proportional to V, because if we double the volume, we should double the number of available states, right? If we assume, using arguments that Sergey Lang used to calculate the volumes of certain substances, that if we start with a cube of one unit on each dimension, then we double one of those dimensions, it should double the number of volume inside of that. So we're gonna assume that the macro states are proportional somehow to the volume, when it comes to energy, we're going to consider a new idea for you, which may be a new idea. We're going to call it momentum space. Okay. And in momentum space, we're going to have coordinates or axes that are not lengths, but momentums. So we'll have momentums in those directions. Did I get it right? Yes, I did. And it's kind of rotated maybe if you're not used to those directions. Um, we're going to place vectors in this momentum space that represent the momentum of the particle. So a point over here, for instance, if this goes down to there, this would be, let's say that it goes over here, this would be a momentum pointing strongly in the positive PZ direction, somewhat in the positive PX direction, and somewhat more in the positive PY direction. So that would be a momentum vector in momentum space. Remember that in momentum space, space, the distance is not units of length, it's units of mass length per time. That's the dimensions of momentum. If we have a single molecule, all of the energy must be stored as kinetic energy, since it's monatomic, and all of the kinetic energy will appear as momentum. Then we can think of the possible momentums, or momenta, as being the surface of a sphere in momentum space. So we have a sphere where every vector that points to this uh, point on this sphere will be a possible momentum that will add up to the total energy that we're looking for. To be specific, we'll calculate out the internal energy is going to be completely kinetic energy. So we, we're gonna use one half P squared over M. This is just another way to write MV squared because P is MV obviously. And we can rewrite this as one half one over m times px squared plus py squared plus pz squared, which should look fairly obvious. This is describing solutions to this formula will be a sphere with radius 
uh, u over, oh wait, 2m u, and it's going to be the square root of that. So the radius is square root of 2m u. So if we have that the multiplicity is also proportional to the energy, then we, this is also proportional to the volume of this sphere in momentum space. So altogether, we're going to say that the multiplicity is proportional to the volume times the volume of the sphere in the momentum space. Now, technically, we're talking about the surface area of the sphere. But he says, well, it, it kind of doesn't matter when you deal with large numbers. He's going to be more specific in, I think, in chapter 6 when he covers this again in much greater detail. The important point is, is that as the volume increases of this sphere, the multiplicity will also increase. At this point, if you are thinking classically, you're probably saying to yourself that none of this matters since everything is infinite anyway. There's an infinite number of positions within the volume. There's an infinite number of points on that sphere. And so we have an infinite number of multiplicities, which means that the math is not really possible to handle, right? So I'm going to switch to quantum mechanics at this point. If we consider things from a quantum mechanics perspective, there most definitely is some countable number of possible positions and possible momentums, and so we do not have an infinite multiplicity, omega. Now, it may be a very, very large number, but we already know how to deal with those sorts of numbers, so we shouldn't be scared of it. Okay? There is, in this book, in Appendix A, a brief overview of quantum mechanics, at least the bits that are relevant to thermodynamics. I don't plan on making a video on Appendix A at this time, but for you it should be a good review, especially if you've taken quantum mechanics before. If you haven't, then this will be good prep on what you need to know to understand the following. So what we need to do is we need to calculate how many possible positions and momentums we can have within this volume and within this energy constraint. What we're going to do is we're going to take this volume in regular space, right? We're going to cut it up into uh, little cubes, right? And what each of these cubes represents is how precise we're being with our measurements on the position. And using the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which says the spread in X times the spread in the momentum. So how accurate you are in terms of space and how accurate you are in terms of momentum, the best you're gonna get is something that's proportional to Planck's constant H. So as we increase our resolution in position space, we're going to be decreasing our resolution in momentum space, okay? So no matter what we choose, well, we should always choose the best we can. We always want the best resolution. We wanna have the highest multiplicity. We wanna see how high it can go, right? So if we take, and we, in one dimensional case, if we have a length L, and then we have a length in momentum space L of P, L sub P, and we take this and we divide this into units of delta x, so each size is delta x big, and we do the same over here for some delta p, then we know that these two are going to multiply together. Indeed, there are L over delta x possible positions, possible distinct measurements we can make, and there are L sub p over delta p possible measurements of momentum as well that we can make. And so when we multiply together in one dimensional case, we multiply L over delta X times L sub P over delta P. And we multiply these together, we're going to get L times L sub P all over delta X times delta P, which is just H. Okay. That's for the one dimensional case. For the three dimensional case, we're going to have the, basically the volume. And this is going to be delta X, delta Y and delta Z. We're going to multiply this by the momentum spaces X, Y, and Z's. And this is going to be over delta P sub X, delta P sub Y, and delta P sub Z. And we're going to get here the volume times the volume and momentum space all over H cubed, right? So each one of those H's arise because there's a dimension in that direction. Although we don't have any constants, you'd expect to see maybe a two or a pi somewhere. This, at the very least, gives you a dimensional analysis, and the units should all work out. And besides, we're going to deal with very big numbers anyway, so whatever constants we discover, we can just drop them anyway. 
Note that it doesn't matter how high a resolution we get in position space. If we choose too high of a resolution, then there's going to be relatively few momentums that we can me measure. And if we want to have very precise momentums, then our precision in the, spa the spatial dimensions is going to decrease. And so it doesn't matter which way you choose. Whatever you choose, you're going to get this on the bottom. You're going to get an H. Okay. So we already have a solution for the one particle case, which is that the countability of one particle is basically V times V sub P all over H cubed, where V sub P is the surface area or the volume, whichever one you want, of the sphere in three dimensions in momentum space. And V is the volume of the space you're constraining the particle to. So let's move on to two particles. In the two particle case, we could think of this as saying, well, the multiplicity of two particles is just the multiplicity of one particle times the multiplicity of one particle. Okay, And this would give us the multiplicity if these two particles had the same energy, but that's not what's happening here. We have to share energy between these two particles. And so the total internal energy is going to be one half m times the momentum of the first particle in the x direction plus the momentum of the second particle in the x direction, plus the momentum of the first particle in the y direction, plus the momentum of the second particle in the y direction, plus the same for the z direction. Okay, let's see if we got all that there. Yeah, so as you can see here, now we have a hypersphere where there's six dimensions. And that's just three times the number of particles, right? So the radius of this hypersphere is, once again, the radius is equal to the square root of 2mu. Um, it's 1 over m, I'm sorry. 1 half of 1 over m times that number. And so playing around with the math above, we're going to get lambda 2 is equal to the volume squared times this new area. hypersphere, the 60 hypersphere, and that's going to be divided by h to the 6. Okay. Now the only remaining issue is that in quantum mechanics we have two particles and you cannot distinguish between these two particles and so we're actually counting twice as many because we're counting if the a particle is there and the b particle is there in momentum or position space it's the same as them being reversed so we have to divide by 2. So this is 1 half v squared times the area all over h to the sixth, right? Now when we move up to n particles, we're going to find that it's going to be one over n factorial, because if you have n particles, there's n factorial combinations, uh, different ways of ordering those particles, right? And then we're gonna have v to the n times the area of a 3nd sphere, hypersphere, and all of that is divided by h to the 3n. Okay, and that's the case for n particles. And if you think about this, the radius of this sphere is still the square root of 2mu. So nothing has changed there. At this point, we need to calculate the surface area of an n-dimensional hypersphere. And when I took this course in college, the professor, he went through the complicated route according to... Uh, Schroeder here, uh, you'll look in, I think it's appendix B is where he lists the formula. One of the problems is to solve it using the more complicated route of taking a, a 3n integral of the sphere, which is certainly possible. It's not that complicated. It, it was the way that we did it back then, but he has a different way where he takes slices and he calculates the area of each slice based on the area of the previous dimensions. And so he has some kind of recursive formula. That is fine. It's a little bit simpler to do it that way. Either way, you're going to get some kind of gamma function in there. And you'll find that the area or volume or whatever is going to be 2 pi times the dimensions to the dimension over 2 power divided by uh, the dimensions divided by 2 minus 1 factorial. And that comes from the gamma function. And you're going to get r to the d minus 1. Okay. And we're going to plug this in. Oh, note that if you aren't familiar with this yet, uh, if you take one half factorial, that's actually going to give you the square root of pi, um, I'm sorry, I wrote it down on my sheet wrong, square root of pi over 2. Okay. Anyway, uh, so plugging this in, we're going to get the multiplicity 
of n particles in a volume with a particular energy is this. I'm going to put the h over 3 in over here. And then I'm going to multiply by this formula over here. So we have 2 pi to the 3 n over 2. And this is divided by 3 n over 2 minus 1 factorial. And then we're going to have the radius, which is the square root of 2 mu to the 3 n minus 1. Okay, and we're going to multiply by square root of 2 mu because we can do that with large numbers. And we're going to multiply by 3 and over 2 as well. So we can drop these. And then we're also going to drop that factor of 2. And so the simplified formula is 1 over n factorial, v to the n over h to the 3n times pi to the 3n over 2 all over 3n over 2 factorial times the square root of 2mu to the 3n. Okay, and that's a simplified version of the formula. Note that if we break this down, we can rewrite this as a formula based on uv and n. And we're going to have some naughty part that only has n's and no v's and u's. Okay, there's the u part. And then we're going to have v to the n and then we're going to have u to the 3n over 2 that we can pull out. And so this is a good way of looking at this formula with these three parts. So we have this number doesn't change as long as you don't change the number of particles. This number changes according to the volume and, of course, according to the number of particles. But if you keep that constant, it's just changing according to the volume. And this one changes according to the internal energy. Now, this is very similar to what we found for the Einsteinian solid. We have the um, energy raised to the power of the number of degrees of freedom. And remember, in this case, the n stands for the number of particles. When we were doing Einstein solids, the n stood for the number of degrees of freedom. And this has to do with the quadratic degrees of freedom thing that I mentioned earlier in section one. And we will not prove this here. There's actually a paper written in 1984, which seems fairly recent for me, it might not seem recent for you, but it does for me, of what happens. Before I bid you farewell, I want to talk about what happens if we have two monatomic ideal gases separated by a membrane that allows energy to pass between them. So we're going to share energy. Okay, so as you might expect, the total multiplicity is going to be the total of the first one times the multiplicity of the second one. And so we're going to get Using our little simplified notation, we're going to get uh, F of Na times V, the volume of the first one, raised to the power of Na. And then we're going to have the internal energy of the first one raised to the power of 3 Na divided by 2. And this is all going to be multiplied by the same, except we're using Nbs instead of Nas now. And we're using the volume of V raised to the power of the number of particles in V. And then the internal energy of B raised to the power of 3 and B divided by 2. Okay. And we can kind of rearrange terms here a little bit. So we're going to get F of NA times F of NB. And that gives us kind of our number of particles part. Right. And then we're going to have the volume of A times the volume of B. Both of these raised to their own in A and in B, and we're going to take the, the internal energy and multiply those by each other, like that. So we have kind of our volume part, we have our internal energy part, and we have the number of particles part. Now if we assume, so if we have the number of particles is equal, then this can simplify even further. So we get F of N squared times VA VB raised to the power of n, and then we get ua, ub, raised to the power of 3n over 2, right? This is fairly basic algebra. So obviously the maximum is going to be reached, so max uh, will be reached when ua is equal to ub, okay? And if we calculate how wide that peak is, then we will find that the area is, 
or the peak is about u total all over the square root of 3n over 2 wide, which is a very tiny number because n is very large. Not very large, but large. So this is a very, very small number. Just like we had in the previous section, it's a very tiny and sharp peak. What if we allowed energy and volume to be exchanged? So we're exchanging volume as well. So we have some kind of piston or the, the volumes can push on each other, okay? Using the same formula above, the two sides have the same number of particles, then we'd find that the maximum would occur at VA equals VB for the same number of particles. So they'd want to have the same volume. And again, the peak would be uh, the total volume divided by the square root of the number of particles. Again, a very small number there that we get. And last thing, what if we wanted to allow particles to travel between them so that we can um, find some case where the particles? Well, we would find if we can allow the particles to travel freely that there would be some kind of arrangement where the particles, not actually the particles, no, the particle density. So Na over Va would come to some equilibrium where Nb over Vb, okay? And so we'd find some equilibrium there, okay? And then it would be a very narrow width there as well. You can calculate that if you want. It's a little bit more complicated to calculate that one. Suppose that we wanted to figure out what the likelihood of all the particles ending up on one half of a chamber, right? And so we're thinking that we have two systems and one of the systems has all the particles, the other system has zero particles, okay? We'd find that this will give you, a, compared to the peak, a two to the minus n probability. And so for even when n is a 100, so like a, even when you're dealing with only 100 particles, he says you would take, you check the state trillions of times a second for the age of the universe and perhaps you would see this occur only once. And when you take n is closer to Avogadro's number, not to be confused with the number of particles in the system of A, but when you take it that's proportional or somewhere near there, it's just, it's simply ridiculous to ever think of this happening. So problem 227 is the only problem from this section. He's asking you to calculate the likelihood that only 99% of the molecules are on one side of the chamber. Uh, it should be fairly simple to do that. You just take uh, Na is equal to 99 times Nb, or Nb is equal to 1 one hundredth of Na, or whatever you want to do. And uh, as a further homework, if you're more interested in the math that goes behind this, I recommend reviewing Appendix A, which is the uh, quantum mechanics. You can't go wrong in thermal physics understanding more about quantum mechanics. And also in section B, appendix B, there is some mathematics behind the hypersphere, gamma functions, and things like that. I don't have much more to say on this. This is a fairly interesting subject. We've come a long way. Next section, we will be talking about entropy itself. Uh, at this point, you should have kind of a sense that the universe is conspiring against us. The universe wants to rearrange things a certain way, not because there's some physical law pushing things that way, but because it's much more likely to find things in that configuration than otherwise. So guys, have a great day. Take care and bye-bye.